I, I retired from the Austin Police Department with over 24 years of experience. What area primarily did you serve in the Austin Police Department? I spent most of my career in the organized crime division working uh, criminal conspiracies uh, in organized crime. Uh, most of our cases were, were, I guess they were prosecuted federally in the Western District of Texas. And was investigating a, a primary part of your duties at Austin Police Department? Yes, that was most of my duties. And I, for instance, I mean, give, give us an example of, of a, a common investigation that you participated in in your 20 plus years. We would, a common one was, was infiltrating, investigating uh, organized crime, large gang conspiracies, uh, narcotics conspiracies where multiple multiple locations would be uh, searched and uh, we would execute search warrants at multiple locations uh, then put the case together and present it to the United States Attorney's Office. And since you retired have you done um, internal investigations such as the one here in Uvalde? I've done yes sir I've I've been doing that as a main part of my uh, retirement. And how many internal investigations have you done? I've done uh, 36. Okay, and out of those 36, how often did you find violations of policy? Uh, last night I was going over them, and I, I believe there's 26, but it's probably about 75% of the time. Again, that you do find a violation of policy, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And you didn't do this report alone. Tell us about who else was on your team. Yes, sir. Uh, I obviously couldn't do everything on my own, so I recruited or I met with uh, Paul Ford, who handled the, uh, the tactical kind of the, the SWAT aspect of the investigation. And what's his experience? Paul was a, he's a, not retired, but he was working with the Austin Police Department, um, and he was our uh, SWAT, uh, one of the SWAT commanders, I guess one of the SWAT leaders at the Austin Police Department. He also, after the uh, Columbine shooting, he put together what we called the Homicide in Progress School. Uh, he designed it and uh, it put that school together. He resigned from the police department and began working a uh, tactical, uh, I guess he's in a tactical position for sales of, of uh, gear, but he maintains his expertise in the SWAT field. Okay, and who is the other member of your team? That is uh, Commander Donald Baker. He's a retired Austin police commander. He was one of my supervisors in the organized crime division. He also oversaw, uh, at different times in his career, uh, different areas. He was in my area for about two or three years, uh, but he was also over the internal affairs division of the Austin Police Department at one time. And back in July of 2022, uh, you were um, hired to do this investigation, correct? Correct. And um, what were you tasked with? What were you asked to, uh, to do in this investigation? When, when I was hired, I was asked to check and basically investigate every police officer, including three dispatchers, that had anything to do with the uh, response to the Robb Elementary shooting. And uh, what was your process? It was to trace their steps, trace their decisions, and uh, determine whether they made, uh, committed any violations of policy. So I, I presume that you started with the policies themselves, so you knew what you were looking for in terms of violations. Correct. Right? Okay. Um, <laughs> and did, uh, uh, tell, me, tell me what evidence you gathered. The, uh, 
When I arrived here, the, the police department immediately handed me a disc that contained all of their body cams, any reports that were written. Uh, I've, I got the car cameras. Uh, there, there were uh, the dispatcher, the 911 call logs. Uh, I received everything that Uvalde, the city of Uvalde Police Department, had as evidence in this case. So, to your knowledge, did the city withhold any information from you? No, sir. Did, did the mayor ever approach you about your investigation? No, sir. Did anybody on council approach you about the investigation? No, sir. <clears throat> Pardon me. Did anyone else with the city approach you about the investigation? No, sir. Before you came to Uvalde, did you have any connection to Uvalde? No, sir. Did, did you know anybody here before you got here? I think many years ago, I came through here one time uh, in search of a fugitive, but I don't remember if we even stopped in the city, sir. Okay. Um, so you started in July of 2022. We're in March of 2024. Um, why did it take so long to get your report finalized? So I, I had a lot of difficulty in gathering all the evidence, gathering the information that I needed to uh, complete a thorough examination of what these officers did. What were the problems? The, uh, uh, the district attorney did not allow me to receive a copy of information uh, regarding this case uh, from other uh, sources of uh, a other agencies. So what other agencies were you eventually able to get information from? A Department of Public Safety, uh, the uh, Border Patrol, and uh, oh, the, uh, I believe the, the game wardens. So I was able to get information from them. And are you satisfied that you did finally get enough information that you do have a complete and thorough investigation? Yes. Did the Department of Justice report aid in that? Yes, they did. I how, was able, how so? I was able to, to uh, corroborate the timeline that I had put together in this case uh, with, with their timeline. And one of the things that was really important that I needed was, was an accurate timeline. I received, eventually I received a timeline from the district attorney that had over 5,000 entries. It would, it would give you the, the exact time by the second and it would give you the officer, like for example, Sergeant Coronado body cam, but it had no investigative notes. So I had to start looking at every one of those 5,000 entries to try and determine uh, what notes were missing. But eventually you were able to determine that, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, the uh, United States Border Patrol was the reason, one of the main reasons that I was able to complete this. And so the standard on determining whether or not uh, the police officers uh, complied with the policy is what? Well, if they violated any, any policies, any SOPs, and also we look to see if they acted in good faith. And that's the standard, correct? That's the standard, yes, sir. Okay. So uh, there were failures that day, correct? There were many failures, sir. So uh, let's go through them. I think one of, the, one of them that you mentioned in your report was communication, correct? Yes, sir. Tell us about that. Just for an example, when the officers initially made entry into the school, they made 28 attempts to use their radios to get information out to the rest of the officers that were showing up. And these were 28 attempts before they were shot at uh, that I counted from the uh, body cams and from the, uh, any video that I received. So did that failure of communication affect not only the officers on site, but the other agencies who were coming on site? Yes, sir, because they had no idea what they were facing when they got here until somebody went outside, outside of the building to get on the radio to request help or request uh, 
breaching tools or whatever they, they requested once they went outside. And Mr. Prado, with regard to um, the, the failures, uh, another one was the report writing, correct? Yes, sir. Tell us about that. So what made it difficult in this case was that the Department, the Department of Public Safety of Texas Ranger Division requested that the officers not write a supplement or not write a written report in their own report writing system. That is, is that common? It is not common. But that in itself isn't a big deal as long as the internal investigation were to have started at, the, at about the same time. But that didn't happen? No, sir. Well, why not? Because the district attorney had requested that we not, not just this agency, uh, Uvalde PD, but none of the agencies begin any internal interviews or internal investigation, uh, I believe, until the uh, DPS report was complete. And it, again, it was the Rangers who advised not to do the interviews, correct? Correct. And why is it a problem that the, the interview was utilized, but not a written report? I, I'm not quite sure what had them make, make that determination. And, you well, know. Let, let, me, let me rephrase that, I'm sorry. Um, I think you said that the, the interview was not as effective as a written report. Oh, correct? yes, sir. Yes, sir. Why because any, any time uh, a police officer goes through an incident, even if it's a simple arrest, the first thing they, they do because they're trained for it is to go back and write exactly what happened on a report. It's going to include details that they may not recollect, you know, a, a week afterwards. So it's really important for them to write those reports in a reasonable amount of time. <clears throat> Thank you. As far as uh, failures, another one that you mentioned uh, was that there was no leader communicating orders, correct? Correct. Explain that. So there you had supervision inside the uh, hallway of Rob Elementary and one, you know, Chief of Police uh, Arredondo was on one side of the building from the south side. And Chief of Police of the Valley Consolidated Independent School District, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, the ISD chief was on the south side of the, of the hallway, and the many other officers were on the north side of the hallway, but there was no communication as to a game plan or, or what, what steps to take next. Were you aware of a memorandum of agreement being in place? Yes, sir. It's called the Memorandum of Understanding. And who is it between? It's between the, uh, the Uvalde Independent School District, the Consolidated Independent School District, and the City of Uvalde Police Department. And what was the gist of that MOU? The main thing in that MOU was it details that the Uvalde CISD Police Department has primary duty to respond and investigate all crimes committed by or against district students, employees, or the general public on or near district property during regular school hours. And under the MOU, who was to effectively take charge? That would have been the, the independent school district police. And in your investigation, did you determine whether or not the Valley Police Department officers were aware of this MOU? Yes, sir, they were. At, at, at least the, the management, the uh, Lieutenant Mariano Pargas, uh, you know, they, they, were, they knew about the MOU. You already mentioned the, the, the problem with communication. Uh, did you find any problems with uh, Chief Arredondo communicating with uh, the other officers, the other agencies, as the day went on? Yes, sir. I mean, there, there were problems all, all day long with communication, lack of it, and uh, he would make phone calls, but the officers had no way of knowing what was being planned or what was being said. So were, uh, it was another problem, another failure, uh, uh, the, the key situation? Yes, sir. Explain that to us. So in this case, there was a point in time where the, uh, the officers were going to make entry, 
They didn't have the rifle rated shield at that point yet, but they were gonna move forward after shots were fired at about 1221. And they stopped because uh, the Bortec commander was not comfortable or confident that they could get in with enough time using a Halligan tool to breach the door. So they requested a key instead. And the, the Uvalde ISD officers did not have a key for that fourth grade building. So the only way to get in that, that room was either with a key or to breach it, correct? Yes, sir. So do you have any experience in breaching? Yes, sir. Tell us about that. So throughout my time in organized crime, we executed a lot of search warrants, uh, usually weekly or bi-weekly we were running search warrants and it was my duty most of the time to be the breacher. Uh, and breaching, it takes practice and a certain expertise in getting it right to avoid any delay at that door. In this case, the breachers normally are used to looking at the door and knowing exactly what it's gonna to take to open up. In this case, uh, Commander Guerrero- With Bortac. Uh, with Bortac, made a determination that using the Halligan tool to wedge in between the door and the door frame was gonna to take too long of, a t of time to get into that door safely, to get in there to, to stop the shooter. And so he's the one who made the call to stop uh, Uvalde Police Department officers from breaching with the shields that they had, correct? Yes, but Uvalde Police at that point weren't the ones that were, that were in front for that. There was already a line. And what's important to know is that at 1155, uh, Chief Arredondo with the ISD was on the phone with uh, uh, Constable Field, and Constable Field relayed to the rest of the, the officers on the north side of the, of the hallway that they were going to evacuate the rooms, I believe the rooms closest to uh, 111 and 112, and then they were going to um, negotiate with the shooter. And that came from Chief Arredondo who was the IC or incident commander, correct? We determined that he was the incident commander in there. And that was the first time at 1155 uh, that any order that, that I know of, that any of the officers knew of, had been given uh, by the IC. And that stopped some things. Uh, Lieutenant Javier Martinez, had planned that as soon as the shields got there, he was gonna approach the door. Uh, but now that the incident commander had made a, had made a decision or a plan, they, they followed their chain of command because there is no way that the officers knew what Chief Arredondo knew and what he was communicating to, to uh, Constable Field. And related to, um uh, the failure with regard to the keys and the breaching um, was also a failure in training, correct? Yes, sir. And Let us know about that. I can give you an example. Lieutenant Martinez, after he was shot or after the shrapnel hit him in the back of the head, he retreated to the, uh, to the T intersection of the hallway. A short time after that, he started moving forward, and there was an officer, uh, Landry, who's also a SWAT member, was in a position where he was aiming his rifle towards the vestibule of the uh, room 11, 111 and 12, and Lieutenant Martinez gave him a hand signal to lower his weapon, and then he started moving towards the center of the, of the hall, I mean, up next to the wall, but towards the, uh, the two rooms, and no one followed. And I immediately recognized that as a training issue because he should have never approached those, there were plenty of people there, they should have gone with him. But Landry, 
followed exactly what the lieutenant said. He lowered his weapon. The lieutenant never gave him the, the, uh, the order to come with him. Although there were other people in the hallway that could have easily fallen in behind Lieutenant Martinez, but I recognize that as it's a lack of training. They didn't practice that. Uh, it, it, if it had been a, a different unit that practices, there would have never been a position, a person going towards that position, towards those doors, without somebody following behind. And in terms of uh, breaching, how many years experience did you have breaching? Uh, over 20, sir. And um, tell us about the Valley Police Department's training with regard to breaching. I don't believe they've ever been to any extensive breaching classes. I don't believe, well, they had not practiced since before COVID when this occurred. And typically, in your 20 years of experience, how often would you practice breaching with your team? Fairly often. The, we would go, but we had live scenarios as well because we would make a lot of entries, but we would practice or go out to training, I felt like every quarter, but I think it, we didn't go that often, but we were out there pretty often, sir. Okay. So another problem, another failure was the lack of equipment, correct? Yes, sir. Tell us about that. So the initial officers that went in, the Uvalde officers, they immediately recognized that they needed a shield to get to that door. The main problem <coughs> in this scenario, in this incident, wasn't the fact that they didn't go to the door. It was they couldn't get to the door. There was eight feet that the shooter could see clearly. And I have pictures in the uh, report but the shooter could clearly see the hallway for eight feet before the officers could even get to the door. So in his, if he's aiming at the, at the person closest to the table here, the, he could see the officers and the officers could only see a blacked out classroom and they were only looking through a small window in the center of the door. The officers could not see where the rounds were coming from. They just knew that the rounds were going through the wall, through the wood, through the, through the doors. And they could not shoot into that room blindly. It, that would have been a serious violation. A violation of policy. And possibly even law, sir. <clears throat> so um, in terms of lack of equipment uh, with UPD, um, what specifically did they not have that they needed? I believe if they would have had a ballistic shield, I believe that would have been enough to get them in that door at that time, or at least to the door. They wouldn't have known that the door was locked. They wouldn't have known that because they had a reasonable belief that no matter what that door situation was, you had the school police there and they would have had a way to get into that door. So, with regard to the, the officers that you investigated, um, my understanding is you, you only included officers who are still employed by the city of Uvalde, correct? Correct. Because a, a few of them have left since May, 20, May of 2022. Yes, sir. Um, but you also uh, investigated uh, Lieutenant Pargas because he was acting chief that day, correct? Yes. So, <clears throat> what... Uh, what type of policies um, uh, did you find with regard to uh, the training of Uvalde Police Department officers uh, that were pertinent? You mean the, uh, excuse me, the? Well, again, you looked at the policies. Right. right. But some of the policies are, were, did not apply in this situation, so I'm just trying to figure oh, out what, what yes. you did look at. It was the uh, active shooter training policy and the, uh, uh, the SWAT. Okay. Policies is what we looked at. So let's get to specifics. With regard to Lieutenant Javier Martinez, did you find that he violated any policy? No, sir. Uh, let me get to that part. Let me back here. <clears throat> Tell us why. So there were no indications of wrongdoing in any of his actions. There was no evidence of serious acts of misconduct in direct violation of Uvalde Police Department's policies. 
uh, that were found in his behavior in the response to the incident. Lieutenant Martinez was the highest ranking Uvalde police officer in the hallway uh, and part of the contact team. Lieutenant Martinez accurately recognized that a rifle rated shield was needed to get past the shooter's viewable zone, which was that eight feet, uh, so that he could reach and then begin to negotiate the door to room 111. Lieutenant Martinez couldn't even see room 112, but he could see room 111. Uh, and the, uh, he was struck by fragments and he recognized that, that the bullets were going right through the walls, right through the doors, right through whatever wood was in between. I found that Lieutenant Martinez uh, made the right decision by not blindly shooting into the room, into the blacked out room. He had no line of sight. He had no, he had no target. Again, that would, have, that, that would have been a violation of policy. Uh, and possibly law, yes, sir. Okay. Um, Sergeant Eduardo Canales, did you find that he violated policy? No, sir. And, and <coughs> all of the officers, uh, uh, Lieutenant Martinez, his actions I found were in good faith. Uh, Staff Sergeant Eduardo Canales, he, there was no indications of any wrongdoing in his actions. There was no evidence of serious acts of misconduct in direct violation of Uvalde Police Department policies that were found through, with his behavior to the, uh, in response to the incident. Staff Sergeant Canales was the second person on the contact team and also received injuries to his ear. He showed unmeasurable strength and focus in his duties because he didn't say anything about it but he had a child in the, in the classroom that I believe was next to, to 111 or, or two from 111. He had a child in, in one of those classrooms. Uh, and he maintained his level-headed thinking. He recognized what was needed. He made the right phone calls to the U.S. Marshals to bring a, a, a rifle-rated shield. Uh, I found that even though he'd been shot at and hit in the ear, that, that his actions were all in good faith, sir. With regard to Sergeant Donald Page, did you find that he violated policy? So Sergeant Page, uh, there were no indications of any wrongdoing in his actions. There was no evidence of serious acts of misconduct uh, that would have been in direct violation of UPD policy. Um, Sergeant Page entered the building from the south side of the building and uh, without his rifle rated vest, he went directly to the shooter's location uh, and arrived at the, on the south side of the vestibule Closest to the door to 111, but no view of 111. He could only have a partial view of 112. Uh, he guided Lieutenant Martinez and uh, Staff Sergeant Canales to the, to the room that he believed the shooter was in. Sergeant Page was standing in an area where a round, at least one round, went right through the wall and had he not moved, the bullet would have struck him uh, in the torso uh, because he saw the round come through. The, uh, he was eventually relieved by an officer carrying a rifle and went outside and contacted Ranger uh, Kendall who arrived and I believe Sergeant Page had told him that they needed more rifles because most of the officers that made entry had, had pistols uh, when Lieutenant Kendall got there, he just asked what, what kind of weapon they needed. And uh, I believe he handed, he handed Sergeant Page his AR-15 and began immediately making calls uh, to DPS or to, to whoever to get assets out to the scene. Did uh, Sergeant Page assist in 
um, evacuating children from the classrooms? Yes, sir. Sergeant Page was also one of the first ones to discover children. And what had happened was Sergeant Coronado, who was also on the south side of the building, uh, noticed that there were, there were bullet holes through a window, in, and I believe it was the corner room, which would have been 102. And Page was going back inside, and, and uh, Sergeant Coronado asked him to take a look inside that first classroom because there were bullet holes in the window. Page and I believe a, uh, a deputy sheriff opened the door and Page saw a teacher pop up with children. And uh, Page came ran, running outside uh, to get them out through the window. And that's when a majority of the evacuations had started. <clears throat> And so, uh, did you find that uh, Detective Page acted in good faith? Yes, sir. Uh, Sergeant, Sergeant Page, all of his actions we found were in good faith. With regard to Detective Lewis Landry, did you find that he violated policy? With, he did not violate policy. And I gave an example of how uh, Detective Landry was focused enough to listen to every single thing that Lieutenant Martinez told him. Martinez, Lieutenant Martinez, Javier Martinez, and Staff Sergeant Canales, they were the, the highest ranking officers from Uvalde. Mike, a little closer to you. Is that better? They were the highest ranking officers from Uvalde uh, inside that hallway. And Landry, so Lieutenant Javier Martinez was the, was the prior SWAT commander. Staff Sergeant Canales was the current SWAT commander. And Landry, I believe, was the backup commander uh, for SWAT. And he followed his orders to the T, uh, even when Lieutenant Martinez told him to lower his weapon, but didn't give him the signal to go with him. Landry did exactly what he was told. And so did you find that he acted in good faith as well? Yes, sir. Uh, with regard to Lieutenant Pargas, did you find that he violated policy? So I separated this, the report into 10 different sections, and, and uh, Lieutenant Pargas was placed on the section for command staff. Had Lieutenant Pargas, so Lieutenant Pargas resigned or retired the day after I, I conducted my interview with him, or within a couple of days of that. And, uh, but had Lieutenant Pargas remained with the uh, Uvalde Police Department, it would be my recommendation, my team's recommendation, to exonerate Lieutenant Pargas. Tell us why. He was obviously the acting chief of police beginning on, I believe, May 22nd. Uh, he immediately responded to the shooter uh, incident, to the active shooter incident from the police department headquarters. As the acting chief of police, Pargas was responsible for overseeing the city of Uvalde's response to the employees and equipment, I mean, for the employees and equipment to assist the Uvalde Independent School District. Uh, in accordance with the Memorandum of Understanding, which Pargas knew. He knew what that MOU was, and he knew who was going to be in charge when they got to the school. Although, when they initially dealt with the shooter, it didn't matter that there was an MOU. It would have been whatever officer arrived first. But once that initial momentum was gone, Pargas recognized that it was the MOU that Chief Arredondo was going to be the IC, uh, incident commander. Uh, Lieutenant Pargas, and by the time Lieutenant Pargas arrived, Chief Arredondo was already on scene and in the hallway by the time Pargas went in. Um, the other thing that, that it, I don't mention a whole lot here, but I want to make sure that it's clear is that it's a reasonable position that UCISD Lieutenant Hernandez, who was second in command for the ISD, uh, was present and at the scene of the on the campus of the Robb Elementary shooting. 
he had the training to do the incident command or the post, the incident command post. He had the training to do that. Uh, I was not able to determine what his, com what his role was out on the scene uh, because the school district didn't cooperate after a few months of, of me being on the case. Okay, so I think we all know that uh, Chief Rodriguez was on vacation and he gave uh, Lieutenant Pargas um, uh, an order to set up a command post, correct? Correct, and that's why I included Chief Rodriguez on this. He, he did not show up to the scene, obviously. He was out of state, but he gave an order to, Chief, uh, to Acting Chief Pargas to set up a command post. And what Pargas did was he delegated that to the person that, was, that knew the most about that, which was Lieutenant Juan Martinez. And uh, so he delegated that, that order to Martinez, who was coming in. He was on vacation the whole week as well, but he heard the incident going on and he came in. Okay, so <clears throat> where physically was Lieutenant Pargas if he wasn't trying to set up the command post? He was at the door, sir. That communication issue was massive. You've got officers inside that hallway that are not able to communicate out. Lieutenant Pargas knew that he had two injured officers in that hallway. One of them, Lieutenant Martinez, who was refusing to leave uh, to get checked out by EMS, that Pargas had to give him a direct order to step outside and go get checked because he'd been hit in the back of the head. Pargas walked with him to the EMS van and uh, Pargas left there, went back to the, to the building while, while Lieutenant Martinez was being attended to. So were you able to determine why a command post was not set up? Yes, sir. One of the other issues on this incident was the, uh, the crowd control, the crowd. At times, they were difficult to control. They were wanting to break through police barriers. There were times where some of the people in the crowd, and not all of them, sir, but some of them wanted to Some of them wanted to get to uh, get to an ambulance, even that was that was there, and the officers that were trying to get the the uh, the ones that were trying to get set up with the command post were having issues with the crowd control because they had to make sure that nobody else in the crowd was injured. Was Lieutenant Pargas part of that? He had to deal with a few things there on crowd control, but he certainly <coughs> told the, gave the officers the order to control the crowd if they could. But that was one of the issues that kept them from setting up the command post. So did either Lieutenant Pargas or uh, Lieutenant Juan Martinez attempt to get uh, a command post set up by contacting other agency heads that were there, or agency members that were there? Yes, sir. And what happened? When they would approach the, uh, the agents or the agencies that were there, they would direct them to someone else in, the, uh, in, their, in their command, but they wouldn't contact them. They would just say, you need to go find so-and-so to join the incident command. Do you feel like they did attempt then to set up the command post or not? Yes, sir, they did. But were unsuccessful? Correct. <clears throat> so, in your report, um, you make various recommendations. I, I'm not going to go through those one by one, um, but would ask you just as an overview, um, what are the recommendations you have? So the big recommendations really came for their SWAT <coughs> and their tactical unit. Um, Paul Ford is the one that put that part of it together. and. He, and one of the main recommendations was to stop using their SWAT unit to, to disband that. They didn't have the equipment, they didn't have the training uh, to continue as a SWAT team. And uh, it was recommended also that they join a regional SWAT team to get the experience so that they could come back to Uvalde and, and set up their own SWAT team once they had enough experienced members. So, are you aware of any other solution 
that's been identified by anyone that would have allowed law enforcement to gain access to the classroom at Rob without field rated shields? No, sir, but I'd like to, to comment about that. Two months prior to this incident occurring, there was a class for active shooter that was put on. Every single member of the instructions team, all the instructors for that active shooter training were inside the hallway, not just at the school, but in the hallway. So you had your training, your, your trainers for this active shooter scene in the hallway with them. And there were no, there were no solutions given other than they needed the shield. I believe there were no solutions given because there weren't any solutions for this. Other than the rifle rated shield? The rifle shield. rated shield or a shield. Uh, a shield would have been better than, than nothing at all. Okay, but wasn't there a point where they did have shields and the BORTAC commander stopped them? When they heard the gunfire at 1221, they started moving forward without the rifle rated shields. They were moving forward with the shields that they had. They were just going to take a chance with those shields. But that's when they realized, hey, we're not gonna be able to get in there that quick with these, with, with using the Halligan tool. So they stopped the line to get the key. So with regard to the, the SWAT training, the, the, excuse me, the breaching training um, that, that uh, the UPD officers went to, right, shortly before the, the incident at Rob's school, was there ever a scenario in any of their training that mimicked what, what happened at Rob's school, where there was a shooter uh, behind a door that was cracked open where he could see out and no one could see in? Was that ever in any of the Uvalde Police Department's training? No, sir. Commander Baker went over this training very closely, and there was never a scenario that they, they put on that, that covered this exact issue that was, that was happening there at Rob. They were being, being shot at from eight feet away from their door. You know, you hear a lot about the fatal funnel, but that fatal funnel, they come into the doorway, which is usually the fatal funnel. The Donald Page had no doubt in his mind that the shooter had set up and started camping. Uh, which is a common term, I didn't know it, but it was a common term used for gamers when the, the person with the weapon gets on one side of the room and waits for the people coming in through the door to shoot them. And that's what he believed was going on. And based on where the shooter was found, uh, that, that may be accurate. So do you have any recommendations in terms of going forward for um, uh, school safety? I have a few. One of the things is any reasonable person would think that the ISD officers would have a key to any place inside any school. I would even recommend that, that here in Uvalde, every officer have access to the classrooms. Uvalde Police Uvalde, Department. Uvalde, correct, sir. And Uvalde officers, because they're also, according to the MOU, they're in charge of covering the area at night. What happens if there's a burglar that goes into one of the school, you know, buildings? They, they would have to gain entry into the school uh, if, if the ISD was not working. And, the, the, you know, one of the other things that I thought of, and, and I would look at it very closely, but I would consider requesting the ISD to adopt a policy that does not allow any children to be taught in a classroom that cannot be secured. I have a theory on what happened with the door based on Agent Guerrero's uh, statement that door had a latch that when you turn the knob, the latch goes into the door. And the teacher would disengage, it would get stuck inside that door because of paint. 
the teacher would disengage that latch by hitting it with the back of his hand. And there's no doubt that that, that door was, was closed, possibly unlocked, or the latch was stuck in the door. In other words, if it gets stuck in there, you could actually pull the door open without ever having to turn the handle because the latch is stuck inside the door. And it was an issue that had been brought up. But you teach the children to, to train, you train them to get in a corner and hide in the darkness. But that's with, with the design that the door is locked. And secured. And secured, yes, sir. In this case, one of the theories that I have about what happened to that door is with the two, two, three rounds hitting the door, it may have had the same effect as the teacher hitting it with the back of his hand to cause it to, to disengage from the door and go into the door frame. Mr. Prado, any other recommendations? N not at this time, sir. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go to Section 5B, Citizens Input on Independent Expert Investigative Report regarding the Uvalde Police Department. Citizens are requested to sign up prior to council meeting for requesting time to address the council. We're going to open this up right now. We're going to extend the time to one hour. We're also going to allow from three minutes up to five minutes for everybody to speak. We'd like everybody that can that is signed up to have the opportunity to speak. There won't be any interaction with the council. We've heard this report, the council and I, for the first time tonight. We have not seen the report, so there will not be any comments from the council tonight. But we'd like to hear from as many as y'all as possible tonight. So I'm going to go start going down the list. Ms. Rubio. He, he has left the buildings. Bring, bring him back! Yeah, why did he leave? Okay. No, why did he leave? He has gone against everything that every law enforcement official has said. And he walked out of here without facing any questions. Okay. From us or the boundaries, sir. Please explain why that is. Okay. Why would you allow that? He no, gave? I don't want. I don't want to hear an explanation. I want him back. I don't want to hear an explanation. I want him back. Somebody, somebody, do the right thing. I worked with y'all. I knew y'all. Do the right thing. Please, please. Please, please let, okay, please let Ms. Rubio speak. Please do what's right, not what is right for a city government, not what is right for what your lawyers are telling you, what's right for the people that you serve, the people that elected you, do what is right. Please do what is right. I just want him here while I address because some of these issues have to do with what he just said. If I can get him back here, he will not be addressing y'all. I don't want. I don't. I don't, don't want to hear okay. from him. Like, I don't want to hang hear on from one, him. Hang on one. Hang on one second. Okay. They went to get. They went to get. They went, let Miss Rubio speak. Please sit. They went to go get him, Miss Rubio. He will not be commenting, but he will hear your concerns. He doesn't have much to say.
I was following the directions I was given, sir. You said they said he wasn't commenting. How dare you? How dare you? You were paid by them, and you just came out and, what was that, a deposition? You said that he was waiting to shoot them like the video games? Of course. That's why they line up, is it not? So that the first one can take it and the others can take this person down? You said that it was best, that there was no way to go in. It was for their safety. It was not for the safety of children. How dare you? And, and you want the DA to give you a report for what? You have like zero reading comprehension. I know some of you, I have worked with some of you. Before I lost Lexi, and I am asking you to do what no one else has done yet, do the right thing. It is not about a recommendation, it's about doing the right thing. There were multiple law enforcement officers from multiple agencies that stood by for 77 minutes as children and teachers died, and I'm not gonna stand by. There are a number of people that I would like to discuss, but today I planned on discussing three people. Three people who had the opportunity to go in 1137, before then, before 1155, when you said, Pirado Dondo said, wait for the keys, or wait to evacuate rooms. Three officers went towards gunfire. They knew what to do. They did that in the beginning. They went toward the gunfire, and then they retreated. Canales and Landry and Javi Martinez at the time were members of the department SWAT team. They had active shooter training, training and they knew what to do. They chose their lives over the lives of children and teachers. And there is no policy change will eliminate their fear and their hesitation to do what is right in the positions they serve. And for that, they should be terminated. Yep. Yeah. 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 And if Lieutenant Javi Martinez cannot get a few people to follow him. How is he helping lead a whole department? I want you to think about the people that you love most in this world, your children, a spouse, a parent. You think about them huddled together in a dark room with a deranged person with an AR-15. Somebody calls 911. Help is on the way. Are these the people that you want responding to your loved ones? Guaranteed it's not. We keep getting kicked while we're already down. It's just blow after blow. And all I heard today was it's the school's fault. It was some of the training instructors. Well, it's because y'all don't serve them, so you're fine saying it's their fault. What you're not fine saying is that it's y'all's fault. Do what's right, terminate them. Change policy. There are people in this department that can benefit from a policy change. They will, they will learn, they will be better, and they will be able to serve. Even some of the ones there, I get it. They were, a patrol officer that was there for a year, two years, is not going to take command of a situation like this if his higher-ups are not. Train them, but these people, they have been serving for years. Nothing's going to change. There's no training, there is no policy that is going to make them put someone else above their own safety. Please do what is right. 
Please do what's right. Think about your loved ones. Think about them. These people should not be serving. Mr. Rubio, would you like to speak? Okay. Ms. Mata? You sat here and you said that you're doing what they told you to do. And that is exactly what you're doing. You are doing what they told you to do. How do you live with, how do all of you live with yourselves? How do you go to bed at night and then wake up every day? Shame on y'all. You said that they did it in good faith. You call that good faith? They stood there 77 minutes and waited. After they got call after call, the kids were still alive in there. All this is, it's a pact. It's a brother's pact. You protect your own. Well, you know what? We're going to stand here and we're going to keep fighting for our own because nobody else is going to do it. And you're not going to stop us. Mr. Cross. First of all, I can't even say that I'm surprised. I mean, like he just said, I'm doing what I was told. Obviously, y'all told him what to do. Y'all told him what to say. And we already know this. Like, it's been two years. Two years. But what I want y'all to do is I want you to look at AJ right here. Every single one of y'all. You too, buddy. You too. I want you to look at this child. Because this child survived this child was shot and he sat in there for 77 minutes while those fucking cowards did nothing you said that that was in good faith and i'm gonna reiterate that point good faith good faith is 77 minutes the true heroes are those that passed those teachers the survivors are heroes. And I am standing here before all of y'all because my son was murdered. He is standing here before you because he was shot. He has more balls than this whole damn town. Every police in this son of a bitch, he does. So I want y'all to look at him. Look at him. Because... Mariano Pargas won't. These other police, they won't. Y'all are in charge. You're in charge. And if you follow the recommendations that they, what did he recommend? Oh, it wasn't our fault. Blame it on everybody else. Y'all been doing that. Y'all been doing that for two years. We are sick of it. We are sick of it. When is enough enough? When is the money not worth more than our children's lives? Actually, answer, answer this, because we pretty much hear y'all, every time that y'all get up and speak or do anything like that, y'all are proverbially, proverbially saying, F our kids. Say it to him. Come on. I mean, there, there were no cojones shown that day. Do we have any to say it to him? And I know y'all are going to hide behind, oh, we can't talk and everything like that. But guess what? We can step outside of here and we can talk as well. I don't have any lawsuits or anything like that. So y'all can't even try that with me. So how about y'all find the testicular fortitude that was gone that day and actually do a damn thing? Mrs. Ariola. It's crazy to think that I sat up here 
for the first time, the exact same location with most of you guys, sat up here and begged y'all, yelled, begged y'all to do the right thing because the families deserved it. And here we are, 21 and a half months later, listening to, I'm sorry, but a bullshit report. And, because we all saw it. And listening to somebody say, I'm not trying to get clapped. If it were my child, I would have breached right away. It's not doing the right thing. It's not, I'm sorry, but it's not. Listening to them sit there and say, shoot, that's a suicide mission. You signed on that dotted line. Those kids didn't. That's your suicide mission, but what about those kids? Those kids didn't sign up for that. They did what they were taught to do in their training, in their policies that y'all enforce at the schools. That's what they were taught, right? Well, what about the guys that had all this training? They didn't do what they were taught. How are they gonna sit there and say, oh, they were sitting there in the dark. They were so quiet, we didn't know they were there. That's what they were trained to do. Mr. Rodriguez, I've never addressed you with anything, but you put that man in charge, and I think it's time that you step up and take a little bit of responsibility for putting that man in charge and do the right thing and make some, some changes in your department. How are we gonna be able to trust the, your department if they did nothing to protect these children? You don't even have people that wanna come it, come apply to your positions anymore because they don't trust what you have because they're still there. If they, can't, if they cannot protect children, how are they gonna protect them? Would you trust somebody that wouldn't even protect a child? Again, I addressed some of y'all. Mr. Mr. Smith, you weren't here at that time. But I'm asking y'all again, do the right thing. These children, the teachers, and these families deserve better. Amanda Vargas. My name is Amanda Vargas, and I was born. I was born and raised in this town. I have five children. Three of them graduated here at UCISD. And I have two eight-year-olds that attend Uvalde Elementary now. No. I need you to remember my eight-year-old son, because his name is Tristan, and my daughter, Jada. And I ask this, not so that if, but when this tragedy happens again, you'll know my children before their names. And jump on the cross. And y'all are sending thoughts and prayers my way, the way we did with these 21 families. You know, they keep, they keep reminding everyone that this shooter, that he killed 19 children and two teachers. And the fact of the matter is, he did, this evil individual, he did. But a lot of them were left for dead by some of our law enforcement. And I knew, I knew in my heart and I know that charges won't be brought against, against those who failed us that day. And I know that. In my heart, I know that. And I just want y'all to know, just please know, that I worry every day that I leave my little ones at school. 
and I pray and I wait. I wait for 3.30, for 3.30. I wait for that bell to ring. Because I know that some of them who failed still hold a seat. They still hold a seat in my community. They're still gonna be there. So I ask you, I ask you as a native of Uvalde, and most, God, most importantly as a parent and as a mother who still have two children there, that these so-called leaders, they, they no longer hold that position if they cannot uphold it. And I'm sure, I'm sure you'll hear that I'm married to a law enforcement officer, my husband of 30 years, but you know what? You should have taken an oath if you can't honor it. Neve, Jacqueline, McKenna, Jose, Eliana, G, Uzai, A. Marie, Xavier, Jace, Tess, Miranda, Eliana, Annabelle, Maite, Lexi, Leila, Jayla, Eliana, T, Rogelio, Irma Garcia, and Eva Mireles. Ruben Zamora. Good afternoon. My name is Ruben Zamora. Do y'all know who my daughter is? I think more, some of y'all do. My daughter was left for dead. Left for dead. And you said they did the right thing? I think right now you almost made me a believer in giving these officers a medal. I almost gave them a medal. I, I don't, I mean, I'm not trying to disrespect you or anything because that's not me, but it, it's, it's disrespectful. I, I was sitting here, I, I rarely don't come to these meetings because I think it's, there's other more things and my daughter's life more important, but you left or you told them to leave we, we all sat here and let him read out whatever he, he had. I thought it was disrespect for him to leave, and y'all let him leave. Y'all, we're not gonna hurt him. We're not gonna hurt a police officer. It would have been done already. They need security. You know what to do. Danny, you know what to do. And if it's right, it's right, it's wrong, it's wrong. I work in the, in the oil fields. If I don't do my job, I get fired. That's right. Plain and simple. I signed up for a dangerous job. I know it's a dangerous job. And that's my job. I got to take care of my job. These police officers signed up to do a job. They didn't do it. I don't know what y'all y'all can do. Do other recommendations as well to Danny. I don't know. But something needs to be done. Because it's enough. It's enough and and thank you for whatever you did, but it was disrespectful at the end of the day, leaving the way you left. Because we all have questions. All of us have questions. We sat here and we I came from work, left work early to listen to this man and he left. We have to be screaming and yelling for y'all to bring this man back. So that's all I have to, you have, you have anything to tell? All I heard was about policy that day. They followed policy, they, they did what they were supposed to do according to policy. But policy doesn't mean anything when there's lives at risk and there was children's lives at risk and that's what should have been considered. 
not policy and not their own lives because yes, they took an oath to protect and to serve and that should have been what they did first and that's what your investigation should have come back with. Did they protect and they serve that day? No, they didn't. My, my daughter is alive today, but not because they went in, because she held on, because she was strong. Nothing that they did saved her life. And I got one more before I, I step down, and I'm, I thank you for letting us speak. Our kids were trained to do shooter training. If y'all don't know this, they were trained, right? They follow policy. Did your officers get trained? I'm not talking about three months ago or four months ago. When they come into the, to the law enforcement, are they trained? Yes, they are. So there's no excuse that was lack of training. Because our 10, nine-year-old kids trained and they knew exactly what to do. The teachers knew what, exactly what to do if something like this happened. They called 911 and they still didn't get help. Children called 911 for them to go in and they and, still didn't get help. And I know it's a waste of my time talking, but I, I felt that I had to come in at least come and help them fight because my daughter needs us, but I need to be out here just so y'all can hear me and see who Ruben Zamora is and my daughter's name, Maya Zamora. And thank you. I don't know for, for why, why y'all here, honestly, but y'all gotta know, it's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. Our kids knew, 10-year-olds and 9-year-olds knew the training. Adults don't know it. And even after your report, everybody knows the truth. Everyone knows the truth and the failures and lives would have been saved. We would still have people today. We would have teachers and children here today, no matter what your report came back, if, if these officers would have done their job and their duty. Laura Garza. Thank God this is not three minutes. I've come up here and I've spoke here, I've spoke at the city, uh, the city council meetings over there, I've spoke at UCISD, I've spoke everywhere. Every time I come up to this podium, I'm like, keep yourself composed because you don't wanna act crazy. Oh no, today I'm gonna say exactly what I gotta say. I have never, ever, ever spoken towards or to Daniel Rodriguez because I always said he wasn't there that day. He didn't do anything wrong. You are doing something wrong. And I'm gonna tell you exactly what I feel you're doing wrong. You left somebody in charge of this town. You hold this town in your hands, at least the safety part. You let this man who left, who was there, and her daughter, a child was in that room on the phone because my niece tried to call 911 and she's no longer here. Her daughter, even after that, still had the courage to call and stay on that phone. And you left a man in charge who left, who left, and he still is able to resign and keep his retirement and sit on commissioner's court and make decisions? How do you live with yourself knowing that? How? I don't understand. You, sir, I don't know. You, you sit in the same category as everybody else. They've had all their training and so many years of experience. What good did you just do all of us? Nearly two years we've waited for this. What did this do for us? Nothing. You're going to sit there in a chair next to everybody else who has failed us. Well, I'll tell you one thing, my niece is no longer here and I'm not gonna let people continue to fail her. I'm gonna keep coming up here and I am gonna look you in your face and I am gonna tell you, look at this child over here. You don't think he wasn't scared? You don't think he's still scared? And you wanna talk to me about your officers being scared? That's exactly what they were, they were scared. Well, how do you think they felt? I don't understand how everybody can sit up here and live with themselves. 
I'm an adult. I go through pain. I cry. I miss my niece. But the children, they're going to live the rest of their lives like this. The parents, Mr. and Mrs. Amora are a prime example. They shouldn't have to be up here doing this. They should be taking care of their daughter, but they have to. And like you said, it might be a waste of time. You want to sit here and tell me lack of training, but then turn around and tell me Canales, who was one of the first ones in that building, is SWAT commander? How does that make sense? He's the SWAT commander, but they didn't follow the first officer in there because they lacked training? He didn't have a vest on. He had a gun, but he did not have a vest on, so he couldn't go, go up there and approach the door. And these kids... I don't understand how you can sit here and, and like basically excuse Vargas. It's a joke. It's a joke. And let me tell you something. After May 24th, all these cops, they hid. They hid. You never saw them anywhere. And now you have Max Dorflinger, Emmanuel Zamora, all up there with their face plastered all over town. And that's the type of shit we have to see. Why? Because it's people like y'all that make them feel comfortable in this town. It's insane to me. It is insane to me. How you can sit up here and say that. And then we sit here, mother's about to throw up, listening to you say this. And then it's exactly like May 24th, I was told to leave. Max Dorflinger, I was just doing what I was told. There was 300 and, and plus officers there at that scene and you're gonna tell me nobody could stand up and say hey guys I think this is wrong hey guys I don't think we should stand up here you want to talk about mr. Ex prime example mr. mr. page in his interview in his interview because it's all over social media everybody's seen it says I've been to so many active shooter trainings and never have I been in one where officers just stand around your own officers and you don't feel anybody did anything wrong there? There is kids dead, teachers dead, children who survived in a class bleeding, teachers who are never going to be the same, and you're going to tell me nobody did anything wrong? Shame on you. Shame on you. Sometimes I think that we live in a world, it's like, are we in a dream? You've got to be kidding me. I mean, if, if just my statement earlier does not contradict what you just said, Canales is, is SWAT commander, but they didn't know to follow Martinez? And that's not a problem? These are the same officers that you still have. They don't know? You yourself just said how many times you breach, how many times in your career that you did so many uh, door breaches and everything. You're going to tell me that none of those officers knew how to breach a door? If you can't even get keys to a door, we got a problem. A big problem. And these are the same officers that are still here. If an emergency happens at a school, why, why isn't, that a, isn't that a hazard? If, if there's a fire, you're going to tell me the only way to get in is through a door? No. I mean, come on. This, this right here is just insane to me. And the fact that it's the blame game. Well, guess, let me tell you something. You don't know who I am, but guess what I'm doing with my life? I have five children, and now I'm going to school to be an EMT. I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to make a difference. But let me tell you, when I go to school, what am I trained? What am I going to be trained to do? If someone drops dead in cardiac arrest, you save them. That's your job. So I'll tell you something. I don't care if you're the president, you. If someone tells me, stand back, don't save their life. What? So if I'm an, if I'm an officer and someone tells me, don't go in a classroom, kids are dying in there, but don't go in. What? I don't understand how people are not, how you're not seeing. This is wrong. How you could sit up here and say what you just said. You know, you know, you all know. And it's like, oh, the families, they, they are crazy. Oh, they just, I wonder why. 
I wonder why. This is insane to me. And I really hope that even though we feel like this is a waste of time, I pray that somebody that comes up in here says something to make somebody change their mind. I really do. I really do. But what you did today, sir, was a slap in the face. And you're wrong. I don't care if nobody else tells you, I'm telling you, you're wrong. My niece is gone. Gone. I will never see her again. And you're going to tell me no one's at fault for that? You're going to tell me that, oh, it wasn't Pargas's, uh, it was Pargas's responsibility to set up an incident, incident command post? We're not going to blame that on Arredondo. Because he couldn't have been in that building and been over there at the same time. Somebody else have to do it. Lack of communication. Since day one, we've been asking for the school board and the, and the city council to meet, to talk, to come up with a plan, to work together. Because then we come here and they say, oh, we have no control over the school board. And the school board, we have no control over the city council. That has yet to happen. It has yet to happen. Somebody make it happen. It's always, well, it's up to them. Well, it's up to them. This little security meeting that we have that you're a part of, Daniel, you can make it happen. You sit up there with the mayor, with the superintendent, make it happen. Somebody make something happen. Somebody be the person to say, today, I'm going to do it. I'm going to speak up. I'm going to make the change today. Somebody do it. shooting happened. That is the last voice message I ever got from her. And for all of y'all, y'all are cowards. Miss Martinez. Hector, you have known me since I was little. We went to church together. Help me, help me be the voice for my son. Help us all fight for our children and our two teachers. You, hearing your report, what you had to say, and saying that the blame was on the parents, the people that were in the crowd. We were willing to go into that school and get our children out, taking our lives for our children. You're saying that these cops are doing, they did it and they don't need to be punished? My son's birthday is on Tuesday. You know how I'm gonna celebrate that? At the cemetery. I should not be doing that. I should be singing to him in his face with his family, his little brothers and his big brother. That's how I should be singing happy birthday to him. But yet I'm here fighting with the rest of them and getting justice for our children. Danny, you've known my husband for years. You are in the man in charge, but yet you say, that you're proud of the officers that you trained? And they're all on Facebook before anything happened on Facebook, taking pictures with the SWAT team. We have a new SWAT team taking pictures. Where was that SWAT team on May 24th? They stood there, frozen, didn't know what to do. They were scared because there was their life. My son survived the 77 minutes fighting for his life. He was transferred by ambulance to Hondo. Fought for another hour and a half. He was trying to come home to be in his dad and his family, but he didn't make it. Help us get changed. Clean out this bed. Clean out.
have this bad. Stop and stand up with us and say, you know what? These offers need to be gone. These officers need to be gone. Clean house. Help us. Mr. Prado, all them breaches that you had, how many times did you have to be told to go in? Let's let that one sink in. Pastor Myers. That outbreak that you saw a few minutes ago, that's people being pushed to the brink. That's people being pushed aside, trying to get answers, can't get answers. Previous mayor, every time we would come to a meeting, nobody tells me nothing. I went up there with, with Mitchell, went over there, and nobody ever tells us nothing. I hope you're not going to be that type of a mayor. And you, John Wayne, have the decency to take your half in reverence to the people. Have the decency to take your hat off in reverence to the families, to the dead children. I didn't hear you say nothing about reprimanding nobody. Nobody got reprimanded. Oh, his little ear. What about the children? They were caught. Come on, John Wayne, take your hat off. See, that's, that's how you guys are. That's how you guys are. Just like McCraw, oh, it was an abject failure. If this department had anything to do wrong that they failed, I'll step down. Freaking liar. Why doesn't he step down? I hope that comes out on the news and he sees it. And then the governor, the governor shows up here and is all his words of wisdom. He said, it could have been worse. It could have been worse. I've heard that him say that several times on the news. With just one, that's more than enough. 19 children and two teachers. This lady right here, Emmy, she just posted the other day, 25 hours I can't sleep for PTSD. It was wrongly and falsely accused. She's trying to sell stuff to put food on her table to pay her bills, and the, and the public school just kicked her out. And you didn't recommend nobody to get reprimanded, turn in your badge. The meeting that we had there at the college, Mr. Moss, I have a lot of respect for him. He said, if I would have been me, I would have turned in my badge and left the state. These idiots are running for office with a big old smile on their posters. Come on, Mayor. Daniel. Mr. Lopez, that's it, what's right here? Did you know that your officers today, right now, are harassing them? Yeah, they're pulling them over, harassing them. Did you, you did know that, right? Today, they're doing it now. They're, they've done it just a few days ago. They got video. Somebody, Mr. Mayor, somebody has to speak up. Somebody has to do the right thing. When we talked with the mayor before, he could never get with the school because I have nothing to do with the school, and the school says we can't do nothing with the, with the city council. Somebody, please, please do something. Thank you. Diana Carruth. Diana Olvedo Carew. I find it interesting that Mr. Prado, the very first 
part of his report or from the questions that the attorney asked indicated that out of all of the investigations that he's done, 75% of those he has found uh, that there has been a problem. I'm very surprised that in Uvalde, our department fell in the 25% with no problems. It's very interesting. It's easy, I believe, to look at the policy that's in your books, to look at the statutes of the state of Texas in regards to police officers. It's easy to take those documents and find no fault. Because what I find in most of our laws is there's loopholes. An easy way to get around the things that we don't want to deal with. These parents have been waiting, this community has been waiting for two years now, almost two years, for resolution. And from everything that's been heard today, we're no near, nearer doing that than we were May 24th of 2022. I myself find it very difficult when Mr. Parado says that the reason an incident command post couldn't be established was because of crowd control. Parents trying to go in to save their own children and others when our police officers wouldn't. If I was that parent at that school on that day, I would be more than offended. Mr. Prado, I know you're, you were hired, contracted to do, to provide a service. You use the information and the tools available to you to put that report together. And realistically, at the end of the day, Mr. Prado's report is not the problem. The problem is our city allowing police officers to stay in their jobs when we all know that several of them should be terminated, others should be reprimanded, and whatever other course of action is available to the city as their employer to address these problems. And really what the parents are asking for is do what's right. Maybe the, the rules say there's not a problem, but in the ethical and moral economy that we're all supposed to live by, do what's right. Adam Martinez. Hello. <clears throat> so why aren't y'all letting him answer any questions? We're not gonna have any interaction, Adam. You can go ahead and speak, please do. So. He, he was able to ask questions, but we can't. We're the ones that need the answers. What's the I'm point of asking things and not getting any answers? You know how stupid that looks? We're all here and y'all don't have to say anything at all? Do you, did you think that was gonna work out? Do you think that's gonna bring people together? Any of y'all? Was that a good idea? Is it working out how y'all wanted it to? It's not working out at all. Can you all answer some questions I then? Answer questions. I have no idea why I can't answer questions. I you, think you should answer questions. So, why can't you answer any questions? Why can't he answer any questions? He answered your questions. Just advise him not to answer if it's wrong. This is a setup. You know what McLaughlin said? He said there's a cover up, right? He said there's a cover up. So was it a cover-up? Was he lying? Was he lying? Right? He said there's a cover-up. That's what this looks like right now. Are y'all going to be part of that? Are y'all going to be a disgrace? Or are you going to make Yavaldi proud? No answers. We sit here. We talk. No answers whatsoever. Well, what's the point of that? That's not gonna bring you Valdi together. You have to join the families. You have to join them. It's just gonna keep getting worse. After the meeting, I'm gonna, myself, Mayor Pro Tim Zamora, 
the chief and assistant chief are going to meet with the families privately today. We'll answer whatever questions we can. We just received the report today. We had no inclination of what it said. So we'll answer what we have, and then I'm going to make a commitment that everybody's going to get the report, the families are going to get the report, the news media will have access to the report, and after we've had a week or two weeks or whatever, I will, we will meet with the families again. Yes, sir. So, what? So why why would you have an active shooter training if you don't have rifle rated shields? Y'all have these trainings, but not the shields. Then what's the purpose of the training if you're not going to go in? You don't have the shield for it. The policy requires that you stop the threat no matter what. Is that right? Yes. Did they stop the threat no matter what? How can you say they did their job? That's what you're supposed to do. Otherwise, you wouldn't have an active shooter policy because there's no rifle rated shields. They're too expensive. That just doesn't make any sense. You said Guerrero told them to stand down, right? Man, he got there way after. He got there like way after and then he didn't even know there was kids in there. He's like, wait, you got kids in there? That's not right, man. They had the opportunity to go in. And then Canales goes and says, oh, we got to go in there. He just keeps shooting. He was the SWAT commander. He says, we got to go in there. He just keeps shooting. Everybody heard that. So did he do the right thing? I mean, he said, we got to go in there. What did they do? They froze. They were scared. Did you see that part where he said, we got to go in there? Of course you did, right? And what about the body cam footage from the DPS? Have you seen that? Y'all need to an answer if there was a cover-up. Don McLaughlin said there was a cover-up. We need to find out if there really was a cover-up. He said that. He said that for a reason, too. We need to find out. Because we're not going to come together if y'all keep on going on with the cover-up. You know, I was expecting to be able to ask questions and all that. I don't know why I was expecting that, but we sit here, we talk, don't get answers. Y'all have to join the families. You need to. That's the only way that if we're going to come together. And accountability, they're not going to stop until there's accountability. You're not going to change our minds. You're not going to change the world's mind just because this guy comes out and says, oh, they did a good job. We all know they didn't do their job. You have to be accountable. That's what we teach our kids. That's what we have to do. You do that, Yavaldi's going to come together. You don't do that, we're not going to come together. We're going to be divided. Okay, we're going to go to action item 5C, consideration and action on waiving the attorney-client privilege concerning the independent expert investigative report regarding the Uvalde Police Department. This is going to allow us to give the report to the families. The news media, there will be a link sent out shortly that will allow you all to access the report as well. Do I have a motion? Make a motion. We approve 5C. A motion by Mayor Pro Tem Zamora. Second. Second by Council, Member, Council Lady Medina. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Mayor, as I'm, as re I'm, Mayor I'm requesting an executive session. We had already indicated that we weren't going to have an executive session. Requesting an executive session. Yes, sir, you can. Okay, I'm the grandfather of Layla Salazar, right? You guys paid somebody to do the investigation. So, in other words, this guy that did the investigation is saying that the investigation that the DOJ did was wrong. 
paid this guy $100,000 for him to do his investigation to come in here and just spit in our face. What kind of respect is that to these families? All of you that are sitting there, you sang at my granddaughter's, when, when we buried my granddaughter, she was the last one buried out of all these children. And you're sitting here telling us that we're supposed to respect the law that we got when they couldn't take care of our children. How come nobody can say anything about that, that they could not do their job and protect their children, but still the city lets them run again? Now, Lasco should have been fired. Mariano should have been fired. He shouldn't even be on the city council. But Mitchell protects them. And he won't listen. He says that. What did they do? Red Cross picked up, they threw him in jail. That was, there's no reason for that when we're trying to voice our opinion on what happened here. And yes, McCoughlin did say there's a cover up. And why? Because the district attorney that you got, which is a Republican district attorney, will not give the answers to the people that they need. I'm not a politician, but you can tell right off the bat that there's something wrong just by looking at who's sitting here. Now you tell me and these people what can be done about this. Because you, you got elected mayor for, for one year or whatever it is. Cody, I've known you for a long time. Yes, sir. But you've been disrespectful from the beginning because you are told not to give us any answers. And that's wrong because these people are waiting for justice, answers, and everything else. We can't bring back our loved ones. Layla was the only girl we had in our family. And that hurts me every single day. I cry for her. And I told her that I will fight till the day I die to get her justice. And I will do that. These people are gonna, coming up here and standing up for their children the way I'm standing up for my, my granddaughter and the rest of the families that lost a child and the survivors. Because what I saw that child that got shot, he was on a bus with the bullet wound in his leg. Was that the right thing to do? And this guy's telling us the police department and all that, they did nothing wrong? The DOJ was wrong? Is that what you're telling me? Everybody's got a copy of that. Did you read it? For him to come up here and just tell us that, no, you guys did nothing wrong. That's bullshit. Sorry. But it's, it's, it's fact. It's in the films, everything is there. So how can he say that you guys did nothing wrong? I don't, I don't understand that. You know, you look puzzled. And uh, maybe now you guys can sleep on it and think about what needs to be done in this town because it's a split town. And you're not going to cure it unless we get the justice we deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Excuse me, Mayor. I know you mentioned at the beginning there will be no comments, but uh, according to Mr. Prado, is this the investigation? Is it completed, Mr. Tarski? It is. Okay, so. You know, they say we can't comment until the investigation gets completed. Well, it's done, okay? And uh, I, I, for one, I'm not gonna sit here and not make a comment 
about what was said, okay? I am insulted, Mr. Prado. These families are insulted by your comments today. Okay? Uh, the way this report was put on display, it was a question and answer. Did they do this? No. Did they do that? No. You know, uh, I wish Mr. Prado would just stand up, take the podium, face the families, and give a report, not a question and answer. Okay? It's not a, just a question and answer. This is not a, this is not a, a, a court hearing, Mr. Tarski. This is not a court hearing. Do we have somebody, an, an attorney from the families to ask him questions, a rebuttal? No. <laughs> this is not the way it should have been presented. I am embarrassed, I am insulted. These families deserve to know, they deserve these answers. They need to have a, uh, a responsive uh, uh, explanation. Not, not just say this happened and that happened, he did, he didn't. Policy and procedures, I know about policy and procedures, Mr. Perales. I've been in law enforcement for over 30 years. And if I violated policy, and I have violated policy, and I was uh, disciplined for that. So, for you to come in here and say, uh, no, everything was hunky-dory, you know, they did their job. I, I, that's, I can't accept that. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go back and I'm going to read your report. I couldn't keep up writing notes here by your comments. I couldn't keep up with them. But I'm going to read your report, Mr. Prado. And uh, I'm going to have a lot of questions. And I hope you're there to answer them or somebody to answer these questions because I want to know. And these families for sure want to know. We owe it to them. And there needs to be some accountability yes. Uh, uh, yes. for this. Yes. This is what the families want. This is what I thought was going to turn out to be accountability. And uh, uh, I guess I'm the only one on this table. I hope somebody else speaks up yes. because they need to. You know, uh, everybody here was elected to represent Uvalde. Everybody has their own district, but we all represent Uvalde. We have to answer to y'all. Y'all deserve it. Right or wrong, you know, you need an answer. If we dropped the ball, we messed up, we need to, you know, we need to face up to it. Thank you. Yeah. And somebody mentioned here earlier that the heroes were Ms. Mireles, Ms. Garcia. They stood up and, and did what they could to protect the children. I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm very insulted by this report. The families deserve more. This community deserves more. We, you know, we're not a big community. This is not New York City. We know each other. We know us with these families. And they deserve a thorough investigation a thorough explanation. I'm sorry, but I, uh, I don't accept this report without further explanation, and y'all shouldn't either. Most of you guys know me, and I'm a pretty straight shooter. I've talked to almost every single one of you guys. And I've been sitting here, I've been shaking for the last hour. I'm so pissed off at what happened today. And I know you guys are, and I'm, I'm hearing it. This thing, we, we've not seen the report. This is the first time we've heard it. We did not know this was going down this way, and I want 
to discuss this in private under executive session, but I assure you this is not what we wanted and this did not happen how we thought it would happen. This is, I usually a pretty good talker and I'm just, I'm, I'm very, very upset at how this went down today and I'm sorry. I apologize to every single one of you. I'd like to have the other members on this council opportunity for them to speak up and say something. They are elected officials. Y'all really don't need to talk if y'all don't, don't want to because I think we got the picture and we know it. This is my first time here. I know a lot of y'all. Y'all know me. Enrique Avalos, Jr. I used to open Walmart. Now it seems to me after hearing this pile of crap, most, if not all, of retail companies have a better active shooter class than y'all. Less than 400 law enforcement officers responded, and not one could breach to get the killer. Every man and woman that took that oath to serve and protect whether it arises, should kill or be killed. That did not happen. Thank you. Okay, we had skipped item number four, executive session. I'd like for us to go ahead and have an executive session. 4A, convening executive session pursuant to Texas government code section 551.071. Consultation with the attorney to discuss pending or contemplated litigation or on a matter in which the duty of the attorney to the governmental body under the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct of the State Bar of Texas clearly conflicts with Chapter 551 related to the Rob School Elementary incident on May 24, 2022. Immediately following that, we will visit with any family members, Mayor Pro Tem and I, uh, Zamora and I will visit with any family members that would like to do so. We're going to go across the hall into executive session right now. It is going back here. Okay. okay, we're going back here to the cactus. Time is uh, 357. House Committee, the Department of Justice. Your report is complete. Sir. You're an independent person. You were paid a significant amount of money to do this. Speak. 
tell us how you could come up Sir, with the these. Report? I have read it. I have read it. Read well, whatever you said, I have, I have said. And I saw that every single officer, you have exonerated every single officer. Sir, with all due respect, you have nothing to save the families. The survivors were here. Ma'am, I'm here. sure there'll be a different time when I can come back and speak to them. They're here right now. now. Why not come to them now? Me to do what I've done, and I'm sure I'll come back at another time and speak to them. This Mr. year? Prado, how we're hitting two you years. To do this report in total. How much did this cost the taxpayers? Do you the of these families and, and what happened here today? Or well, you're just not going to answer our question. I'm not going to answer at this point. Why not? This because is your opportunity to speak with, to them. I'm not done with the job on their side. I'm done with the report, but they still have some questions. That they need to ask. Well, you so left. You left, and you wouldn't answer their questions. No, you left. You left. Do you disagree with what the Department of Justice said? A parent is here now asking you she questions. Wants, she wants to ask you right now. She's here. They're, They're here. Her son's birthday should have been Tuesday. Answer her. His name is Xavier Lopez. You're not going to talk to his mother, Felicia? She's right here. You're not going to talk to her? What did you want to ask him, Felicia? If he really felt what he had to say today was the right thing. What I want to ask him is that how he really feels that the officers did. Did they do right? Did, does he really believe that they did right? That's kidding? what I want to ask him. How does he sleep at night knowing that this is what he had to say? And he hurt all of us today, just opening wounds after wounds after wounds. I wanted to ask him if that's really how he felt. That's what I wanted to ask him. But as usual, just, you know, protected by the officers. They like to protect those ones that are adults that could just walk around, but they can't protect the children, our children. I wanted to ask him that question. Can I ask you to tell us, tell us about your child that was? About Xavier. My, my baby is Xavier. Yeah, tell us a little bit about him. He was full of life. His birthday's coming up on Tuesday. And we're gonna go and celebrate with him at the cemetery. Instead of celebrating with him at a table, sitting across for him singing happy birthday. We're gonna be at the cemetery singing to him. We can't do our traditional what everybody does when they get to shove the face in the cake and everybody laugh. Because he loved doing that, he thought it was funny. We don't get to do that with him. We don't get to do the cake on the face, the icing on the nose, or you know, on the brothers. We're not gonna get to do that. Or the waking up at midnight telling them happy birthday, giving them kisses. We always wake up, everybody, everybody in our family we always wake up at night, at midnight, and we always sing happy birthday. Because we like to get the surprise face. Get it, you know, just surprise. We don't get to do that with him. It seems like Prado was scared. That's why he left abruptly before answering yeah. your questions. Xavier was scared in his last moments too. He was. Yes, he was. But he fought. He fought for as long as he could. And that's all we're asking for these people to do is to fight, just like Xavier did, can, but can, they won't. Can you believe what he did, like how he came in here and, and essentially said what he said, given? No, no. And then to say that the crowd was the reason why the cops couldn't get in there, there was cops already in there and they didn't do nothing. They froze. Us parents, families were willing to go into that school, willing to give their lives for them, to get them out. They didn't do that. So we just want justice. We want justice for the 21. We want justice for the victims. We just want justice, you know, for all of us. That's all we want. And we're just asking for these people to stand up and say, you know what? I'm done being part of this ugly crowd. Let me stand up and be the man and say, you know what? I'm gonna do what's right. That's all we're asking is for somebody to stand up for us. Your taxpayer dollars went to pay for this man to do his investigation. Six figures to do this investigation. Is that money well spent out of your pocket? That's my son's blood money. Those are my kids, our children. That bled, that's their money that paid for this ridiculous joke of an investigation. That's what that was. That's what that was. Thank you.
Thank you, guys. Thank you, dear.
and then we are going to visit with the families. There's no press allowed. It'll be like 30-ish minutes, at least. Um, you need a shooting team. Hi, Todd. Um, can we uh, make sure we're rolling uh, on Live View 8? Uh, these guys should be teased. Thank 
At least. Okay. Um, we can just have it here. Um, heartbreak and disgust here in Uvalde. I'm going to ask him really quick how much we spent. 